Hello, everyone. Welcome. And if you have any difficulty hearing me, please uh, let Dusty know and he can pass along that message to me. Uh, so I'm excited to be here. I hope that uh, you all find something in this webinar that is useful for your clinical practice. Uh, we're going to be covering the ACT matrix, which is an application from acceptance and commitment therapy, along with creative hopelessness, which is a an intervention and a, um, a skill set uh, that we can use clinically to help uh, our clients, our patients, to get unstuck from unworkable patterns in their lives. So um, let's see here. Second, okay. So just a few disclosures here. Uh, I work. I have a full-time gig at uh, Sutter Health. Uh, the Institute for Health and Healing, which is an integrative medicine program in Sacramento, California. Uh, I also provide training events for various organizations. I have a small private practice in Davis, California, where I also provide individual training and consultation, both in person and online in acceptance and commitment therapy. Uh, my graduate school training was very humanistic and existential in nature. I went to Lesley University, uh, have a master's in counseling psychology. <clears throat> and, uh, and then I kind of uh, worked in a various CBT settings in the years that followed and, you know, uh, became familiar with behavior analysis along the way. But I really didn't start diving in until I got into acceptance and commitment therapy. So I kind of came into it through the back door um, and just really over the last five years or so. And um, I've been working with BAs uh, in both workshops and doing some individual training and consultation as well. So with that, I'm gonna review our three primary objectives for today. One is to perform a functional contextual assessment of behavior with the ACT matrix. What that means is essentially looking at how our behavior, how our client's behavior functions in the context of their lives and in the context of what we call inner experiencing and outer experiencing. And specifically, we're looking at when their behavior is under the appetitive control of their values, what matters to them, or, what's on, or when it's under the aversive control of what we call their hooks, distressing or painful private events. We're gonna be utilizing the matrix to formulate and deliver therapeutic interventions. We can actually call upon relational frame theory and to, um, to use relational frames as interventions within the matrix. And we're gonna look at how we can do that during the latter part of our webinar today. And then finally, all along the way, we'll be um, undermining unworkable experiential avoidance, i.e. essentially doing creative hopelessness as a means of um, compassionately confronting the control agenda that people will often come into clinical, uh, to therapy or, into, or for clinical assistance with. At the same time, we're gonna be reinforcing values-guided action through augmenting, through using, once again, certain kinds of interventions. So, but before we get into that, I like, I often uh, will take folks through an orientation into ACT, sort of like an ACT origin story, if you will. Um, so we're gonna spend the next half hour doing a little bit of orienting to the underlying roots of acceptance and commitment therapy. Uh, as a means of better uh, understanding where the matrix comes from, what we're attempting to do with the matrix, with and why creative hopelessness is an important intervention. So ACT has its roots in a philosophy called functional contextualism, uh, a science called contextual behavioral science, and there's a website, uh, contextualscience.org, uh, uh, which is the Association for Contextual Behavioral Science. And of course, they use technology from, or we use type technology from applied behavior analysis. So while ABA existed long before CBS did, uh, CBS has its roots in behavior analysis as well. Uh, and then there's a theory, relational frame theory, which is a theory of language and cognition uh, from a behavioral perspective uh, that was developed in the 1980s along with acceptance and commitment therapy, which is one application 
of these roots. So there's a quote by uh, Russ Harris that I really like where he says, uh, act is like driving a car. Functional contextualism, relational frame theory, and applied behavior analysis are how the engine works. Now we can drive well without knowing anything about the engine. In other words, uh, we can do therapy or do or, or uh, provide clinical interventions in acceptance and commitment therapy effectively without necessarily knowing anything about the engine. However, if we do know something about the engine, we're gonna be better equipped and prepared, not should, but when our car breaks down, because we're all gonna get stuck. Clients will bring in issues or challenge certain interventions in a way where we're not sure where to go to from there. Or we're gonna have days when, you know, we're feeling, you know, especially tired or maybe even burned out. And, and once again, feeling like uh, um, not having a sense of kind of what is most needed with this particular client in this moment. Sometimes we can lose sight of that. And having an idea of how the engine works, I have found can um, help us to better use these approaches more functionally as opposed to more topographically. So the philosophy, functional contextualism, this is a, an extension essentially of B.F. Skinner's radical behaviorism, first delineated by Stephen Hayes in the 1980s, and really kind of starting with this paper in 1984 called Making Sense of Spirituality. So that was the paper where he you know, started laying down the foundation of functional contextualism, of even processes like self as context that are within the ACT model. It's a philosophy concerned with how psychological events, and events would include thoughts, feelings, overt behaviors, how these all function in specific contexts defined both situationally within the client's life today, as well as historically. So there's an emphasis on the function over the form of behavior. So what do we mean by this? Well, let's take an example like uh, cutting on one's forearm, right? So that would be the form of behavior, cutting on, on a forearm. Now in a context such as if someone's feeling neglected, the function of that behavior could be to get attention, right? In a context where someone is fused, meaning hooked or um, uh, kind of really being pushed around by a thought such as I'm bad, the function might be self-punishment. Uh, in a context where stress is viewed as intolerable, I can't take this stress, the function might be a release of tension in the cutting. In a context where our emotions are seen as too painful, it might be serving to distract oneself from those emotions. And in a context where we're viewing our body as a canvas, and, I've, and I don't know about you, but in the 16 years I've been practicing, I did have one client who came in with carvings all over his body that were self-induced. And to him, he was creating body art. That was the function of his cutting. So there was really, from my perspective, and especially from a functional contextual perspective, there was no need for intervention there. And then in a context where someone's feeling numb, the function might be to try to feel something at all, right? So we're paying attention to the function of these behaviors because that's gonna help to determine how and when we're going to intervene. The goal of functional contextualism is to predict and influence behavior with precision, scope, and depth. And what we mean by that is um, using processes uh, that specifically mediate outcomes. So working uh, with precision. Scope in that these processes we're using, such as diffusion, values work, committed action, are broadly applicable across a wide range of not just diagnostic categories, but across the spectrum of human conditions. And that can include uh, in improving sports or academic performance or in various health pursuits. And then depth, uh, Steve Hayes and colleagues have, have uh, paid particular attention to ensuring that ACT, relational frame theory, uh, the science uh, are all coherent with other levels of scientific analysis. 
Now in ACT, in acceptance and commitment therapy, the goal, the specific goal is to enable mindful valued living. This is our, what we call our true criterion. In ACT, this is called workability. Workability refers to how effective behavior is in moving one towards living a meaningful and fulfilling life. We're not concerned with whether the behavior is right or wrong, good or bad, true or false. In fact, for the most part, I've kind of eliminated those words from my vocabulary, at least clinically, um, because uh, that's not what we're working towards. We're working towards how effective, how helpful uh, one's behavior is and their values goals. So just to give an example of kind of what we mean by workability, I'm going to ask you all just to, uh, to answer this question to, for yourself. Is a spoon a utensil or a tool? So it depends on the context, right? In a context where there's a bowl of ice cream sitting in front of us, that spoon is likely going to serve as a utensil. In a context where uh, I'm about to leave in the morning and putting my tight shoe on and I don't have a shoehorn around, but I have a spoon, it might serve as a tool or perhaps get, helping to get a jar open. Or if I'm in an escape room and the only way out after solving every puzzle is to unscrew some bolts and all I have is a spoon, well, once again, that spoon is going to serve as a tool. So what's true, what true is what works in a given context. That's workability. So I, I know you guys coming here are essentially all familiar with applied behavior analysis. So I'm not going to spend much time on this and I'm going to move through this very quickly. Um, but I want to make sure that it's touched upon um, in reference to the ACT matrix later on. So um, this is a technology for predicting and influencing behavior based on learning theory and behavioral principles. And a specific tool that we're using in ACT is functional analysis. And we're analyzing the function of behavior through ABCs, right? So through looking at antecedents, behavior, and consequences. And so we have the antecedents as the conditions preceding behavior. And from a, an act and a functional contextual perspective, this is not just going to be the conditions immediately preceding behavior, but also we're going to look historically too, like what um, what's the client's learning history look like? What has kind of predisposed them to perhaps, you know, acting in this way at this time in their lives? Where, was there trauma in the past? Were, were they around, do they have parents who were very perfectionistic in nature? Um, what's their current setting like? So we're looking at all of these various antecedents as potential uh, um, uh, influencers on a, a person's behavior. So the behavior is going to be an observable, measurable response. And once again, from a functional, contextual, and relational frame sort of perspective, we're not just interested in overt behavior, but also covert behavior. So thinking and feeling as um, private events that can also be viewed as behavior. And then consequences. What are the outcomes? What are the effects on the person's life? And specifically, we're interested, of course, in reinforcement and punishment. And in the case of uh, ACT, we're especially interested in reinforcement, looking at what's reinforcing unworkable behavior over time and how do we want to reinforce more workable behavior over time. So just as a quick example here, let's imagine someone is alone at night in their home. They're feeling especially anxious, maybe restless, maybe worried, um, and they're experiencing urges to drink or use based upon historical patterns of drinking or using various substances uh, to uh, when they've been alone at night in the past as well. And so they drink alcohol or they smoke marijuana. And one of the consequences that might occur is relief uh, from that anxiety and craving. So there's negative reinforcement at play here. And we could say that the function of this behavior was to avoid or get away from the antecedents they were experiencing. Same example, but here instead, let's say uh, as the client is alone at night, feeling anxious, experiencing these urges, they use some mindfulness skills. You know, they might um, notice and name that there's anxiety showing up. They might um, uh, uh, 
use some urge surfing or kind of ride the wave, breathe into the urges they're experiencing. And at the same time, perhaps they're reminding themselves of how important it is uh, to be fostering social connection in their life and how meaningful that is to them. So, and so in, in this case, their response is to call a friend or maybe go to a, a support meeting of some kind. And one of the consequences they might experience is relational fulfillment. So we might say the function of the behavior in this case is to move toward relational values. Now, in reality, we know that behavior is often under both appetitive and aversive control. It's not so dichotomous. So example, if, if we call a friend when we're alone at night, am I moving toward connection or am I moving away from loneliness? It likely could be a bit of both happening. And if I drink alcohol when I'm bored, am I moving toward feeling buzzed or moving away from boredom? Once again, there could be a little bit of both happening. With that said, in practice, and when we're using the matrix, I find that that doesn't matter so much. Um, I find that it's uh, clients, if they can use this toward and away reference um, as a means of helping to make more flexible choices in their life, that's what's really workable. So we don't necessarily, we will touch upon, and we'll touch upon this later when away moves can also function as toward moves at times. But for the most part, I find that it's not necessary. Um, so the aims of an ABC analysis from the perspective of, of acceptance and commitment therapy and the matrix is um, to identify clinically relevant behavior, right? And, and clinically relevant could be problematic behavior or could be effective behavior, uh, to as assess the workability of behavior, and to activate behavioral changes by increasing what could be referred to as functional contextual awareness becoming more aware of what influences one's behavior. In other words, being more aware of the contingencies or the antecedents and the consequences influencing one's behavior. And we do this by shaping their skills in observing, describing, and tracking behavioral contingencies. And we do this with a lot of uh, open-ended, evocative questions, and we'll touch upon that later. And then there's the theory that underlies ACT. Uh, relational frame theory is a modern behavior analytic approach uh, that proposes human language and cognition is based on relating, where any objects or events, i.e. stimuli, uh, that are relationally framed in this bi-directional nature become verbal, become part of our verbal networks, part of our symbolic languaging and our speaking. And so, and these relational frames are arbitrarily applicable, arbitrarily applicable. So what do we mean by that? Well, let me take you through uh, a quick example here. We can look at how they can, these relational frames can be arbitrarily applicable. So relating is simply responding to one thing in terms of another. So if I said an apple is a type of, you might say, fruit. In this case, we are framing the apple in hierarchy with a particular category. It's part of a category fruit. Or, and, 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 and note that in this case, this hierarchy is arbitrary and that you know, humans have said, okay, an apple is a part of this category, part of, of being a fruit. Um, an apple is the color, let's say red, or it could be green. And in this case, this is based more upon intrinsic or physical properties. An apple is this color. An apple is than, let's say, a cherry. Once again, in this case, it's based upon physical, non-arbitrary properties. It's bigger than a cherry, physically bigger. An apple is different from, now, we could say an apple is different from a chair, and that's going to be clearly based upon very physical, intrinsic properties. We could say an apple is different from a pear, and that's also going to be based upon maybe both physical, uh, but also some arbitrary properties in terms of how it might taste. Um, and then we could say an apple a day keeps the doctor away. This would be an example of a conditional uh, frame, a conditional relational frame, because it's, it's a cause effect frame. So if we eat an apple a day, that might keep a doctor away. And this is also serves as a rule, and we'll get into rules in a little while. So these are the types of relational frames. We have 
at least I should say, these are the types that have been most studied over the last few decades. So we have coordination, which is where we're framing two things as similar to each other. Uh, we have comparison, where we're looking at how these two things are more or less than, better, worse, bigger, smaller. Distinction and opposition, which are kind of related to each other. Distinction is, this is different from that. Um, you know, so let's say my ring is different from this cup in my hand or opposition. Um, we could say that, uh, you know, that um, um, forward is the opposite of backward. Hierarchical, once again, this is about class membership or framing something as a part of something else. Conditional framing, cause, effect. If I do this, then this is likely to happen. Spatial framing, this is looking at things as near, far, front, back. And notice that front, back is also, you know, opposite framing. Temporal framing, before and after. So we're looking at framing things across time. And finally, deictic framing, which is uh, also known as perspective taking. This is uh, um, framing across person, space, and time. I, you, here, there, now, then. And this is a very important type of relational frame that gets developed between two and four years old, typically and um, is very much at the heart of developing a sense of self and a sense of self in relation to others, as well as, of course, um, um, being able to develop a locus or a perspective from which we can view space, time, and person. Um, we also develop social skills, including empathy from didactic frame. And all of these frames can be trained uh, to our benefit but they can also serve, as Steve Hayes say, says, as much of our misery in lives. So let's look at a quick example here of intrinsic versus symbolic relations, or in other words, relating something based upon physical properties versus arbitrary properties. So you'll notice a nickel and a dime here on the screen. Now, if I ask you which of these is bigger, if you, if you base that upon its physical properties, you would likely say a nickel. Just as if I ask you know, a two or three-year-old which one is bigger, they're gonna say a nickel. Now, interestingly, as I was preparing for this uh, presentation today, I showed this to my five-year-old son and I asked him which is bigger and he paused for a moment, right? Now, a year or two ago, he would have said the nickel, but he paused because he knows the dime is worth more right? And so he kind of said both. First he said the nickel and then he said the dime because based upon arbitrary properties, based upon what humans socially assign uh, as value to the dime, that is bigger or more than the nickel. And how is this significant? Well, think about this. I can compare myself to anybody else as more than, as less than. And it could be based strictly upon arbitrary properties, right? Um, so uh, with, that, you know, with that in mind, our, what we call our conceptualized self um, can be a source of a lot of pain and suffering for us as we're constantly comparing and judging ourselves against other people. And from that, from these relational frames, we can derive rules, specifically using conditional framing. Uh, conditional frame, once again, is like an if-then, a causal, uh, relation um, where we are uh, relating actions to anticipated consequences, emphasizing anticipated, like if I eat an apple a day, that'll keep the doctor away. Or if I exercise every day, I'll have better health. Now, likely, sure, that might happen based upon the research, you know, that would likely happen. However, we don't know that for sure. And I, in an ideal world, we want to encourage tracking of the actual consequences. When you've exercised over the last four weeks, what have you noticed as a result of doing so? As opposed to just prescribing exercise, let's say, as something that's gonna be healthy for them. We want them, we want clients and ourselves, we wanna be able to track our own, the effects of our own actions. Now, um, following rules can be really important at times, especially to jumpstart the learning process or even to jumpstart behavioral activation. Like if you make a recommendation to a client and they willingly follow it at first, great. 
Um, however, over time, we might be inadvertently fostering what we call pliance. Pliance being um, behavior that's rule governed and socially reinforced. So I'm essentially doing this because you're telling me to do it. And what's going to happen once the stimulus, once you are removed from the picture, um, there might not be any intrinsic reinforcement for the client if they're not tracking the actual consequences of their actions. So the other issue here is um, I can learn very quickly with rules, but there's also a loss of flexibility, meaning like, let's say I'm given a recipe to bake something and I have this recipe and I make something. If I'm not paying attention to like my family's tastes, what they like or what they don't like, or perhaps, perhaps the, the person who put the recipe together made a mistake, or perhaps the person who made the recipe likes food to be especially salty, right? So if I'm not actually tracking what's happening along the way, tasting the recipe along the way, um, and only following the rule because it's a rule, well, then I'm going to lose sensitivity to the context, right? We call that a loss of flexibility or a loss of sensitivity to the context. So just as another example here, uh, for those of you familiar with the show, The Office, one of my favorite all-time shows, um, this was a scene here where Michael and Dwight were driving back to the office from a sales call, and Michael was using the GPS in his car, and, and uh, the GPS was telling him to turn here into this lake. And Dwight is saying, what are you doing, Michael? There's a lake here. And Michael's saying, the machine knows. Stop yelling at me. Essentially, what he's saying is, you know, my mind knows, stop yelling at me. So our mind is generating rules all the time. And most often, these rules are generally helpful. You know, this is how you tie your shoes, or this is how you put on your pants, or brush your teeth before you leave the house. Um, and at the same time, uh, rules can be incorrect. You know, they might not... Um, uh, the consequences produced from rules might not be the anticipated consequences. So in this case, he follows the GPS into the lake and um, uh, because there's, once again, he's lost sensitivity to the context. And what's interesting is a couple of years later, <laughs> this actually happened in Lake Huron. Uh, this was on the news, I think in like 2016, something like that, where now to her credit, to the person's credit, it was late at night, there was fog, um, so she couldn't see, but the GPS had instructed her to turn right into a lake. Okay, so human language is like a double-edged sword. There's a bright side in that we can learn without doing. Like if I tell my children, please don't play at the top of the stairs, that's an important rule to follow because I don't want them to necessarily have to fall down the stairs in order to um, experience those consequences for themselves. So it's a, you know, in that case, the rules are working well, like that they're designed in, in the way they're designed to. Um, but the dark side is we can rigidly follow rules, like in, you know, parenting, if I've been taught, like, I, you know, that my children should always be doing X, Y, or Z, and I'm not flexibly adapting to their changing circumstances, that can result in problems. We can reflect and extract um, from the past, but we can also get caught up in rumination. We can plan ahead for the future. And of course, we can also get caught up in worry. We can imagine and invent incredible things, such as this laptop I'm working on or um, uh, you know, buildings and other structures. We can also confabulate about ourselves, about others. We can describe and compare. And of course, we can judge and criticize ourselves and others. We can communicate to the envy of all the other species on the planet. And of course, we can communicate ineffectively or harshly. And then finally, we can solve problems out in the world. And we can also engage in what we call experiential avoidance, which is trying to problem solve the world within of our thoughts and feelings. So I'm going to invite you to participate in a short little uh, demonstration with me of getting to know the problem-solving machine within our own minds. So here's the task. I'm going to ask you to just observe what you see. And if you have a 
if you already have a printout of the PDF, put that aside so that you're not looking at it and just look at the screen right now. And I'm gonna ask you to simply observe, to just notice as a witness what you see on the screen without doing any problem solving. And what I mean by that is without trying to fix anything, change anything, or, um, or remove anything. So without really without trying to fix, change, or push away anything, okay? Or debate with anything. Here we go. So can you just observe without answering that question, without solving it? Probably not. So this one's a little bit harder. Can you just observe that without solving it? Just notice how innate, you know, um, how, how powerful that urge to problem solve is based upon our learning history. How about this one? Can you just read the words without solving it, without answering it? How about this one? Can you read it once again without trying to fix anything? Here's an interesting one. Can you read this one without your mind debating it or trying to come up with contradicting evidence? And similarly, can you read this one without your mind contradicting it or disputing it in any way? Some folks will find that difficult to do because our mind likes to also pull for opposites, right? If I'm perfect in every way, you might notice your mind saying, no, I'm not, or look at what I, when I did X, Y, or Z. So these are all covert forms of cognitive problem solving. Worrying, when we're worrying about the future, like what if this happens and what if that happens? What am I gonna do, right? That's problem solving about the future. Analyzing, why did this happen? Why is this happening to me? Once again, we're trying to problem solve. Disputing. And then ruminating, rulemaking, and reason giving, giving reasons why I can't, shouldn't, won't do X, Y, or Z. And once again, not that there's anything inherently wrong with any of these. In certain situations, at certain times, this can be really helpful. In fact, especially when it's applied to the outer world. So imagine our earliest ancestors out in the savanna, and they encounter a saber-toothed tiger. There could be a lot of value in problem solving, right? Asking ourselves, what if he starts charging at me? Are there any weapons around? What am I going to do in response? Do I have something to protect myself? Is there somewhere I can run to? All this problem solving that occurs, occurs for a good reason, for survival purposes. Our mind evolved to survive threats like this. However, we then apply these same skills to our inner world, and it work as effectively as we would like it to, as we think it should. So if I say, don't think about the following, whatever you do, put the following image out of your mind. Do not think about a pink elephant. Don't think about the color pink. Don't think about a big pink elephant wearing black glasses. Just put it out of your mind and see how well you can do with that. And by the way, the pink elephant is your first secret code word. So write that down, pink elephant. Now, it's when we try not to think something, and similar, same thing with feelings, when we try not to feel anxiety or sadness, it's like we're trying to hit a subtraction or a delete button that has been unknowingly replaced with a multiplication sign. So instead of subtracting it, we're actually amplifying it, even though that's not our intention. Now, it's not that we don't do any problem solving in ACT, we do, but it's it's occurring out in the world guided by our values. We're just not engaging in symptom reduction as a primary goal of ACT. In other words, intentionally trying to reduce, get rid of, change, fix, control, difficult thoughts and feelings. So the aim here is to fundamentally transform our relationship with thoughts and feelings, how we relate to our private events. And we do this by altering the context in which they occur and, and thereby transforming their function. So as an example, you'll notice a piece, piece of pizza on your screen in two different contexts. 
On the left hand side, that pizza is sitting on a fine dime plate with a fork, a knife, and a spoon. And I'm not sure what you would need the spoon for, but there's one for you in case you'd like one. There's a glass of wine, a fireplace. And on the right hand side, we have that pizza sitting on a manhole in the middle of the road. Now, which piece of pizza would you rather have? Chances are you would choose the one on the left because there's more appetitive functions given the context than the one on the right. Now in therapy or in a clinical context, oftentimes we're not able to change the physical context. Now, some of you might be able to do that at school and in people's homes, but oftentimes we are working with the context of language. So that's the primary context we're working with. So take a statement such as life is not worth Imagine that's a thought that someone is having. You know, life is not worth living, or what's the point? Well, not that this would necessarily be a clinical intervention, but we can alter the context here to say the unexamined life is not worth living. And that's a quote by Socrates. And just notice how that alters or changes the function of that original statement, right? From something that may have been more painful to something more interesting or more curious now. So in ACT, there are two primary contexts we're working with. Mindfulness as a context to help to um, transform the function of uh, painful, uh, I'm sorry, of thoughts and feelings previously viewed to be problematic or symptoms into nothing more or less than transient private experiences. And in a context of values, a life that matters, painful thoughts and feelings mean I care. There's something I care about here. Now, with that said, many of our clients will often still come in with what we call a control agenda or a problem-solving agenda. They are there to um, reduce, get rid of, solve, eliminate their anxiety, their stress, their depression, their anger, whatever it is that they might be presenting with. It, it's as if they, they've gotten into a tug of war with their own private events by trying to get rid of them, right? And there's a struggle that will ensue within them often as we do that. And we could pay attention to that within ourselves. You know, if you had stayed with that pink elephant and and spent the next two minutes really trying hard to not think about the pink elephant, chances are that would have created a struggle within you. And imagine what that's like if we're doing that with like really significant anxiety or restlessness or sadness or shame or anger. So creative hopelessness is about noticing this control agenda in place or this problem solving agenda in place and the basic unworkability of that agenda, at least over the long, and especially over the long term. And we'll, we'll get into that. We want to name the agenda as inappropriately applied control strategies. And that's not the terms we would use, but that's essentially what we're working towards. And to examine why and when this doesn't work in the context of the client's life, not based upon our biases or opinions. So just because, let's say, someone's smoking marijuana, you know, and we have, let's say, certain biases about that, we're instead of allowing that to influence, you know, what's workable or not workable to the client, we're more interested in how it's functioning in their lives. To create space for something new to emerge, in this case, something new being psychological flexibility, which we'll get into shortly. So the methods we use in creative hopelessness include drawing out the client's emotional control strategies. And we could do this by what we call connecting the dots. There's a worksheet online called Join the Dots by Russ Harris to give you a better idea of what this entails. But essentially it's an acronym for distraction, ways we might distract ourselves from our difficult thoughts and feelings, such as through social media, through overworking, cleaning, um, shopping, O would be for opting out, opting out of people, places, activities, events, including events that might matter to us. And then T stands for uh, thinking strategies, playing out what if scenarios in the future, overly ruminating on the past, uh, overly uh, what I call analysis paralysis, where we get caught up in anal uh, analyzing, maybe uh, every time an uh, um, um, unpleasant thought comes up, we try to just focus on the positive, once again, trying to 
get rid of those what we call neg or what they call negative thoughts. And then S would be for other strategies, and this could include substances, self-harm, sex, or even excessive sleep. And we're examining the workability in the client's experience, both in the short and the long term. So in the short term, oftentimes we'll find that these, um, these control strategies do provide some relief for them, right? And we'll validate that very briefly, quickly, but we validate that. Um, because it, it would make sense that they would be using these things to, to, give, to get some relief for themselves. And we also want to focus on the long term. What's happening in the longer run in terms of costs that these strategies might be having in their lives? And we're not assuming that they're having costs. And some of these control strategies might not be having any costs. But we want to evaluate these costs in terms of their health, physical, mental, spiritual, work, or school leisure, relationships, finances, etc. We use creative hopelessness as a precursor to the rest of the work in order for new responses, uh, new responses to emerge, like when the struggle switch is turned on. And once again, when they're struggling against their own internal experience, when they come in saying, I can't feel anxious anymore, or I got to get rid of this, um, then you know there's what we call fusion with the problem solving agenda. With that said, it may not be necessary in some cases. There are times when um, I'll do some creative hopelessness right in the beginning of therapy, in that first and or, and or second session, and that's all that's needed. There are times when I might be sprinkling it throughout therapy, um, weaving it in and out depending upon what shows up, and that's probably most often the case. However, I've had uh, some clients, and especially in the integrative medicine setting I work in now, where they're really open to doing different things, things that they haven't done before. Not all, not everyone, but many of them. And so their willingness to do, different, to do something different, including acceptance work, is already present. So there's no need for creative hopelessness necessarily in those cases. So some considerations with creative hopelessness, we want to intervene respectfully and compassionately. We're never attempting to coerce or convince or bully a client into doing something or believing something. Uh, their experience is what matters. And the goal is not a feeling state. We're not trying to make clients feel hopeless, but rather to see the hopelessness in that control agenda. And in other words, to realize that they've painted themselves into a corner. Uh, so imagine that, you know, they're, let's say they're substance use, they're staying in bed all day, they're opting out of activities, distracting themselves with social media, and all of this as a result has made their world small or restricted it in some way, um, which is often the case, or has disconnected them from their values, from doing what matters to them. Well, we can say they've kind of painted themselves into a corner. And sometimes, not often, but I might have a client stand in the corner of a room and notice the restriction in their movement in that corner, right? There's less flexibility in their movement. And the only way out is through, to quote Robert Frost. Like, so there's paint all around them. And they might say on the other side of this room is what matters to them. And of course, we want to identify what, it, what their values-based goals are. What is it that they want to work towards? What kind of life do they want for themselves? And imagine that's on the other side of the room. And the only way to get there is to walk through the sticky, wet paint of difficult thoughts and feelings. Are they willing to do that? Are they willing to, to walk that walk? as you support them through that process if it means they get to live the life they ultimately want to live. So creative hopelessness made simple. First, we're listening for what we call, once again, the emotional control agenda, the problem solving agenda. We might hear words such as, I need to reduce or get rid of, I need to feel better. And um, for, for return or follow-up sessions in my full-time job, um, I'll have clients complete a one-page sheet on uh, psychological flexibility skills. There's five questions, and then there's a sixth question that says, what would be important for us to work towards today? And I'll pay attention to what they write there. And so if they write, you know, get rid of my anxiety, 
that's going to be on my radar. Now, it doesn't mean I'm going to necessarily confront that directly right off the bat. However, I am going to be, have that in mind and likely do a little bit of creative hopelessness along the way. And, and that might be, once again, with compassion and validation, asking certain questions. Like, can you tell me what you've tried? Like, what have you done this past week or what have you done over the course of your life to try to get rid of your anxiety? Oops. And how has that worked for you? You know, how has, um, you know, using that substance or how has, you know, using social media or distracting yourself, how has that worked for you? Uh, have you noticed any benefits? Has it been effective at times? And have there been any costs? Like, what does it cost you? Like in the longer run, as you spend an increasingly amount of time isolating in your bedroom, or as you spend more and more time, um, you know, not returning phone calls of your family or your friends, have there been any costs? And what is that like for you? Now, this can be a hard question for therapists or clinicians to ask. Um, and this is once again, where it's like that sense of like, wow, I've painted myself into a corner in that I've been doing these things and I'm still stuck, you know, and, I'm, and it hasn't in, in the long run, it's not helping or in fact, things have gotten worse. So we want clients to make contact with this, at least briefly, because we're looking to transform the function of this emotional control agenda. Because up until then, this agenda has been high priority. It's been very appetitive for them. So we're transforming the function by altering the context and looking at these longer term effects that might be happening and having them sit with that. And then finally, are you open to something different? Right? So are you open to, to us doing something different here that might be more helpful to you in the long run, but could be hard work in the short run? So, and that's something different is psychological flexibility. This is the overarching aim of ACT, to contact the present moment fully as a conscious human being and to change or persist in behavior when it serves valued ends. Okay, so the ACT matrix is a diagram designed to cue psychological flexibility and sorting the differences between moving toward our values versus away from painful private events, i.e. the function of our behavior, and the differences between our outer or our overt uh, behavior and our inner or our covert behavior. And in this case, we're talking about the context of our experience, so the function of our behavior in a given context. And in the matrix, we're dividing context by our the outer physical world and then our inner private symbolic world. So this is what the matrix looks like. There's uh, now the matrix was um, uh, created by Kevin Polk, Jerry Hambright, and Mark Webster. Uh, it's been modified, uh, and there's several of it online. Uh, this is my version, um, and other versions might not explicitly list values and hooks here, but I do. And instead of outer and inner, you'll often see five senses experiencing at the top and mental experiencing on the bottom. And I can you know, describe a little bit more why I use certain terms. So I'm going to walk us through the matrix and, and I'm going to invite you to participate in a little experiential exercise with me as we go through this. So uh, we have this vertical axis, which represents the context of our hear, touch, taste, smell, and what we do with our body, what we're doing with our body out in the world. And then we have our, um, and then we also have our mental experiencing or our inner experiencing, our covert behavior, what we think. Oh. Give me one quick second here. Okay, sorry. So we have our covert behavior, what we think and feel and sense within our body. Um, and so, and then the functions of our outer experience can be transferred onto our inner world. So I'm going to walk you through a little example of this by. Um, asking you to pick up an object right now. So ideally you have a pen 
and if not, a piece of paper. So either a pen or a paper. If you don't have a pen or a paper around, you can use any object that's around you. So to pick up that pen or paper and hold it in your hand and to look at it, notice what it looks like. Notice the shape and the colors. Also notice what it feels like in your hand. Notice the texture, the texture, the, um, the size, the shape, the weight. And I'm gonna ask you to tap that pen or paper against something. It could be your leg or any, any object around you. Just tap it and notice what that sounds like. And if you're willing, you can hold up the object to your nose and see if you could detect a scent. And then I will not ask anyone to taste the object. That's up to you. So now I'm going to ask you to put the object down, whatever it is, put it down and put it out of sight so that you can't see it. And if you're willing, you can close your eyes for this next part of this uh, little exercise. So with your eyes closed or looking away from the object, I'm going to ask you to once again, bring a, a visual representation of the object to mind. So uh, imagine you can see the object and what it looks like. Perhaps remembering what you saw. I'm going to ask you to imagine you're holding the object in your hand and what that might feel like, even though you don't actually have it in your hand. But see if you can imagine that. Imagine um, that you're hitting the object against that same uh, thing that you did before and what that sounds like, remembering that sound. And now I'm going to invite you to Imagine you're hitting that object against a metal can, right? against a metal can and what that would sound like. And notice whether, whether you've ever actually done that in your life before, you can still imagine what that's like. You can still bring up a, a mental experiencing. There's covert behavior happening that might be new, even though you've never done this before. Similarly, I'm gonna ask you to imagine that you are now 20 feet above the object looking down, 20 feet above looking down and what that object would look like. And then finally to imagine that the object is now 20 feet away from you in the distance and you're looking at it from afar. And notice that even if you haven't had those experiences in the outer world before, we can have new experiences. We can come up with new experiences in the inner world, and that's through relational framing. We can relate in, uh, in the inner world in a way that we have not in the outer world before. So you can open your eyes. Now notice, not only do the functions of our outer experience, in other words, as you remembered what the pen looked like or the paper and, and remembered what it sounded like, not only do those functions transfer onto our inner world, but we can have new experiences in our inner world that we never had in our outer world. So now I'm gonna ask you to pay attention to the horizontal axis of the matrix, which represents the function of our behavior or the purpose or the intention of our behavior. And um, imagine a bunny rabbit living out in the wild. What kinds of things would a bunny rabbit want to physically move toward in its lifetime? Perhaps food or other bunny rabbits mating. What kinds of things would a bunny rabbit want to get away from? Predators, right? so animals that might eat it, so physical threats. Now, as humans, of course, we also exist on this plane in the outer physical world. And we're also interested in moving toward food and mating and moving away from physical threats for survival purposes. However, because of our inner world and relational framing, we're also interested in when we're moving toward our values, what matters to us, the kinds of qualities we wanna bring into our lives, moving toward meaning and purpose. So simply moving toward food and mating and moving away from physical threats is not enough for us to feel a sense of life satisfaction. So there's a whole nother level here that we're working with. So just to give you an example of what it's like to move toward our values and away from our hooks, 
I'm gonna, this will be a shorter exercise, but I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes again if you're willing. You don't have to, you could just look downward. But to imagine someone you deeply care about, someone you deeply care about. It could be a child or a partner or a friend or family member. And imagine that you are physically moving toward that person to give them a hug. Imagine you're reaching out to give them a hug. And just notice what that feels like. Imagine how they would feel. Imagine what they might smell like and look like. Some of you might even notice a, a slight smile creeping up here. Okay, and now I'm gonna ask you to put that image aside. Okay, that's an example of a toward move. Now I'm gonna ask you to scan your body from head to toe and to uh, see if you can detect anything uncomfortable right now, anything unpleasant. This could be um, like an emotion, like fear or um, sadness. This could be a physical sensation, like an ache, a pain, or muscle tension, or fatigue. And now I'm gonna ask you to very firmly say no to your experience. Whatever you're feeling, that unpleasant feeling, firmly say no to it, as if you're denying it or pushing it away. And notice what that's like. Some of you might notice a struggle ensuing within you as you do that. And some of you might actually experience a little bit of short-term relief as you say no to it. So there's no right answer here. What matters is how you experience that. And that is an example of an away move when we're moving away from a difficult experience within us. So turning your attention back to the screen here, our values, at least from the perspective of acceptance and commitment therapy, are freely chosen qualities of action, verbally constructed, freely chosen qualities of action, desired ways of being and behaving in our lives within different domains. And domains being, let's say, in the domain of family or parenting or work or education or health, community, these different domains in our lives. Now, traditionally, with the way the matrix was developed, um, they're not necessarily focusing on these freely chosen qualities of action as I have here. They're usually asked who and or what is important to you. Once again, what they're usually asking here is who or what is important to you. And the response is that when I had used the matrix in that way, the responses I would typically get would be domains. Well, family's important, or education's important, or um, you know, uh, being a good parent is important. And so, you know, five, six years ago, I started using the matrix more in this way, where I'm more interested in identifying those chosen qualities of action, which we'll touch upon more specifically soon. Because I, I think, once again, it's more in line with the uh, approach of relational frame theory and acceptance and commitment therapy in terms of um, the way values are outlined. And um, I think that uh, these can serve as these overarching um, and intrinsic, intrinsic sources of reinforcement. Intrinsic, intrinsic meaning it's coming from within them and overarching in that um, this is something they're moving toward uh, through their what we put through through their actions, and in this case, what we call toward moves. So toward moves are behaviors under the appetitive control of their values, and this can um, bring on positive reinforcement as a consequence here, because as we move toward our values, if we're taking, for instance, let's say, I value being a, a loving partner. And each day when I come home, I give my wife a hug, right? That's me doing a toward move um, as part of or in line with this value of being a loving partner. Or let's say I'm interested in contributing. Right? That's a value, a quality that I wanna be bringing into my life, being a contributor. 
and providing this webinar would be a tour of me for me as one way of contributing to people's lives. And when we make that conscious connection, once again, that could be positively reinforcing. I'm more likely to keep doing this as a result. And then of course, we have our painful private events. These are our hooks, uncomfortable thoughts, urges, emotions, sensations, anything that shows up, shows up within our bodies. And our away moves are behaviors under the aversive control of our hooks. We don't like them, we don't want them, and oftentimes we're doing things to get rid of them, move away from them, and that can um, uh, result in negative reinforcement in that, in that short-term relief I get from, let's say, smoking a joint or um, you know, um, avoiding talking to someone. I get some relief there and that could be negatively reinforcing and that something has been removed or taken the process. Now, the problem here is we can get caught in a stuck loop where there's short-term relief, but it's unworkable in the long run. And some of you may be making the connection here that this is creative hopelessness right here, right? So we're, you know, noticing and, um, acknowledging the short-term relief, but also evaluating the costs in the long run. And we'll get more specifically into that shortly. So putting this all together and at the center and perhaps the most important piece here is our observing self in act, um, you know, this is one of the processes or part of one of the six core processes, this locus or perspective from which we can view and experience um, all of our behaviors, our covert and overt behaviors, um, to notice our toward moves and our way moves. So we're strengthening this ability to step back and observe where we're at on the matrix at any given time in our lives. So I'm gonna walk us through a case presentation here, and then we'll sort this uh, person's experiences on the matrix. So imagine a uh, middle-aged Latina female who's in therapy for depression and overall life dissatisfaction, especially with regards to uh, the domains of health and relationships. And she frequently will make statements such as, I'm lazy, I have no self-discipline. Look at all those people running out there, they have self-discipline, I don't. And she'll follow up with, with statements such as, well, it's true, or I can't change. Her daily routines are dictated by a have to mentality. I have to do this, I have to do that, often berating herself about what she should be doing. She complains of feeling lonely and sad much of the time. She'll smoke marijuana or sit on the couch all weekend long um, and then feeling ashamed for, for doing so because her kids walk in and wondering why she's sitting on the couch all weekend long. And in her words, she'll booty call her uh, verbally abusive ex-boyfriend or attempt to fix others' problems. She was constantly looking into other people's lives and looking for problems in their lives that she can work on. And of course, you know, as we'll see, that was a form of experiential avoidance. She was avoiding her own difficult thoughts and feelings in doing so. So she appears more vibrant when she's sharing about her acts of kindness uh, in volunteering and she also enjoys dancing and socializing with her friends, listening to music, live music. She expresses a wish to model responsibility uh, for her kids at home and engage in healthier behaviors overall. Um, so what does a case conceptualization look like in terms of the matrix? Well, as far as, far as hooks, we can say that um, some of the feelings she's experiencing, <coughs> excuse me, are loneliness, sadness, shame and guilt. Um, we're noticing a self-concept here of I'm lazy, I have no self-discipline. And there's some signs of fusion and pliance. Fusion being once again, when we're dominated by certain thoughts. Um, and pliance being once again, when we're engaging in rule governed behavior that's socially due to social approval or socially reinforced in some way. So when she says, well, it's true, or I can't change, that's telling us there's likely some stickiness here with certain thoughts. And uh, when she says things like I should or I have to, that's likely indicating that there's some pliance happening here. Experiential avoidance, so are her away moves, in other words, are uh, cannabis use, once again, to relieve herself from what she's experiencing down below, 
inactivity, just staying on the couch all weekend long, once again, because so that she doesn't have to face anything else, booty calling and attempting to fix other people's problems. You know, these things, once again, these moves, these behaviors provide her with some short-term relief, but clearly there, uh, there's some significant costs in the long run, many of which she was already in touch with when she first came to therapy, but not all. And then over here in the lower right quadrant, um, we can look at both domains and values here. Sometimes I'm just focused on values. Sometimes I'm touching upon both with clients. It kind of just depends. But in the domain of community, like, well, you know, she talked about volunteering. It's important for her to be kind, to be helpful. How does she want to be or behave in that domain, right? Those are the values. In, in, the, in the domain of friends, she wants to be fostering connection, having fun, being humorous. In the domain of parenting, she wants to be modeling responsibility. And in the domain of health, she wants to be taking better care of herself, be more attentive, really. I should, I should add that she wants to be more attentive to her health as well. And then toward moves would, would be committed actions. What is she doing? Now, the, the ones listed here are pretty general. If I'm working with a client, I'm likely going to start here and then get more specific. Like what, you know, what's the first thing you can do over the next week? that would prepare you to do some volunteering, or if you're gonna be eating healthy and exercising, what would be an example of that or a small step you would take? So I'm gonna get more specific than what you see here. And then, so what would a clinical interview look like? So we have a client, I usually use the matrix in the first or second session, most often in the second session, sometimes later. Sometimes I'll bring it back out later on. Um, but we could ask something like, and of course, this is going to depend on the age of the client. Um, if I'm working with a eight or seven or 10 year old, I'm going to ask, then I'm going to use the more traditional um, matrix questions because I think they're simpler. I might just ask what's important to you or who's important to you. I might just start there. But if uh, they're, a, you know, a, a late adolescent or an adult, I might start with like, what are your hearts? deepest desires for how you want to live your life or how do you want to treat yourself and or others right that might be another thing i might ask or in the face of this challenge what do you want to stand for so you could use the matrix as a more general assessment and clinical intervention process or you can use it with regards to a specific situation or challenge i might ask what thoughts and feelings tend to hook you or get in the way of moving toward your values, right? What thoughts and feelings tend to show up um, when you're, you know, about to be the person you want to be? So in other words, if someone wants to be more patient with their children and they might notice a hook showing up of irritability or agitation, as an example. Now, what do you do to get away from, uh, to get relief from, or when you're under the influence of these hooks? So we can look at away moves in a couple different ways. We could look at it in the most traditional sense, which is experiential avoidance. What do you do to get away from these hooks? However, I will also bring in this other kind of more fused version of away moves, which is uh, what do you do when you're under the influence of these hooks? So for instance, like if I'm agitated and I snap at someone, um, you know, that may or may not be to get relief from that agitation. It could bring me some relief from the agitation. It could be in a way move, but it might not necessarily be. It could be that I'm hooked, you know, by this feeling of agitation and I'm just acting on it. I'm under the influence of this hook. So I might, when I do away moves, I'm putting both up here in, in the upper left quadrant. And then finally, what could you do to move toward or act on your value? What does that look like? And, um, and then ultimately the kind of a, a primary uh, intervention here is, are you willing to hold these hooks, this feeling of irritability? Are you willing to allow that to be there as you still do a toward move, as you be the parent you wanna be, as you be patient, can you still be patient in some way, even though it might be hard to do. Are you willing for that irritability to be there? And 
you know, listen for the next five minutes as your child shares with you about X, Y, or Z, right? As an example. So that's, that's you know, essentially acceptance and commitment right there. Are you willing to have this or hold this and move in this direction at the same time? So there's a, a, an overarching intervention that we use uh, with the matrix. Uh, and this is in the book called The Essential Guide to the Act Matrix, matrix, which is listed at the very end of the PDF and the very end of the slides here. But it's called Verbal Aikido, which is essentially a yes and move. Yes and, <coughs> excuse me. So Aikido comes from martial arts. Um, and is my understanding is it's about receiving and then redirecting energy as opposed to opposing it, fighting with it, struggling with it. We're receiving, and in this case, the energy is our human languaging and cognition. That's the energy. The things that clients say or do, our own thoughts and feelings that show up in session. So redirecting the energy into noticing, into sorting it on the matrix, and to creating more flexibility in our choices. That's what this is all about. So we might say something like, ah, and that thought right there, like that, you know, that I, I have to please everybody. Where would that go on the matrix? So they might put it on the lower left. I have to please everybody as a thought or as a rule. And what do you do in the presence of? So when that thought is right here up on you of I have to please everybody, what do you do in the presence of that thought? Well, then I end up putting aside my own needs and um, doing X, Y, or Z for other people. And what effects have you noticed from that over time? What effects have you noticed on your health, on your life over time? Once again, this is a little bit of creative hopelessness here if they're able to make contact with any cost. And finally, are you willing to carry these hooks with you as you move in that valued direction? If it meant living the life that you long to live, this is that kind of ultimate accept and commit intervention. Verbal Aikido for away moves. Once again, transforming the function of these away moves so that they're less appealing to them and that they become more aversive. Um, we first validate the away moves and the short-term payoffs that they give with respect to the context. Of course, given what you've been through in your life, given the trauma you've experienced, given that um, you know that what the message that was modeled for you growing up of you can't feel or or think x y or z it would make sense that you would be doing these things right or in the context of this particular situation it makes sense that you'd be doing these things so um once again this is that and this is creative hopelessness but just a different version of it so we're validating any their way moves in terms of the, their own individual situational and historical context. We can even bring in an evolutionary context here, right? We're all designed to move away from threats that we might be experiencing. And then we assess the long-term effects or the, and the cost. Have any of these away moves eliminated your hooks in the long run? Have any of these away moves made hooks worse over time or created new problems for you? In other words, as you continue to have a few drinks every night to relieve yourself of that stress, um, has your sadness, anxiety, shame, has that worsened over time? Or has it created any new problems in your life? Like as far as in your relationships as an example. And then there's verbal Aikido for toward moves where we wanna augment functions, augment um, reinforcing uh, functions. So um, we're, we do, what we do here is we're connecting their actions to intrinsic and overarching sources of reinforcement, i.e. their values. So we might ask, what qualities of who you want to be are you enacting in this toward move? Right? A quality of who you want to be, this is something intrinsic within them. Are you enacting in this toward move? Or what would this tour move be in the service of, right? So this is that overarching focus. What would this be in the service of? How is this meaningful to you? And how might these tour moves bring more fulfillment to your life in the long run? So we're helping them to develop a more long-term view of their lives and, and their behaviors. So a little bit of practice now. 
I'm going to invite folks to engage in a little bit of practice. Now, if you are with a partner, if you're, if you're sitting physically with someone as you're watching this uh, webinar, then um, I'm going to invite you to do this as a partnered exercise where you're going to be interviewing each other. If you're not with a partner, you can do this by yourself. That's fine. Um, uh, but if you're with a partner, once again, I'll invite you to do this as a clinical interview. So, so the, 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 we're going to go through uh, walk around the matrix here, starting on the lower right. Now, sometimes people ask, does it matter where you start? Not really. It doesn't. And oftentimes, um, um, it depends upon what's showing up in the session. I'll just start making some, like I have a dry erase board in one of my offices, and I'll just start making some notes in one of the quadrants as stuff is showing up. But other times, if we're doing this more formally, I explain what the matrix is, what the vertical axis, the horizontal axis, as, I, as we did earlier. Maybe not in as much detail, but I'll, you know, I go over that. And then we start in the lower right quadrant, or I give them the choice, which quadrant would you like to start in? Or I might say something like, we usually start in one of the lower two quadrants with values or with hooks. Where would you like to start? That's what I usually say. So what kind of clinician do you want to be? What qualities do you want to bring into the work you do? Right? So once again, when you think about the kind of clinician you ultimately want to be, do you want to be empathic or caring? Do you want to be um, someone who's supportive, uh, someone who's um, 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 compassionate or validating, or maybe there's another approach you want to take as someone who's respectful. What thoughts and feelings tend to hook you or get in the way of being the clinician you want to be? Right? So what thoughts or feelings show up within you in the middle of a session or as you're anticipating working with a particular client? And then when you're under the control of these hooks, when they are primarily influencing your behavior, what do you do? How might this impact your clients? And these are out here in the world. So these, are, these moves, these behaviors would be observable by others. So um, in other words, what would I see you doing? Would I see you shifting your posture, turning away from them? Would I see you sitting further back? Would I see you speaking faster or being more directive or didactic as opposed to let's say more experiential um, would i see you being more abrupt in some way or would the opposite would i see you just shutting down and just listening and not saying anything and then toward moves what is it what does this look like or what does it look like in session to be acting on your values to be empathic or supportive or to be um, effective, you know, what does that look like? And how might that impact your clients? Just quickly reference the Hexaflex from, from, the, from ACT um, to determine how to proceed. So once again, what we're doing is we are uh, building or enhancing psychological flexibility. And uh, just generally speaking, we are working with what's referred to as selfless context by helping our clients just to become more aware of their inner experiences, especially their self-story, their self-narrative, and how that influences their behaviors. Uh, to contact their pre the present moment by connecting with their outer experiences, what they see, hear, touch, taste, and smell, and what they're doing with their bodies, um, and bringing more awareness to that. And then, of course, with our hooks, we're doing diffusion even just the act of writing thoughts on a dry erase board on a piece of paper can provide a little bit of distance, a little bit of space, or, or call naming thoughts as thoughts, as opposed to rules that we have to live by, can also serve uh, to provide some diffusion. Acceptance instead of experiential avoidance, we're helping folks to turn towards their pain to look at it in a compassionate and a flexible way by opening up to what shows up in the moment. For instance, right here, right now, can we allow this sadness to be here as it is without necessarily trying to push it away or change anything? Values, once again, we're helping them. And, and by turning toward our pain, oftentimes that allows us to contact what matters because 
we hurt where we care and we care where we hurt to quote Steve Hayes. So we can often find values inside of our pain if we're, if we're willing to stay with it long enough. And then of course we are um, committing these values into action, doing what it takes to promote more psychological flexibility in our day-to-day -day lives. So how do we do this with interventions? We can use relational framing as interventions to evoke and reinforce psychological flexibility. Now, there's a book called Mastering the Clinical Conversation, which is a book essentially on clinical RFT and probably the first of its kind. Um, and there are two overarching goals from a perspective of clinical RFT, flexible context sensitivity and functional coherence. In some ways, we can say that these are two branches of psychological flexibility. Uh, and more specifically, we are helping clients to notice the various features of context, including their an the antecedents and consequences that influence their behavior, and to respond to what's most relevant. If I'm, you know, if I'm in a social situation and I'm feeling anxious, and I also really care about making social connection here, responding to that that desire to, to foster more social connections, that would be responding to what's most relevant given my longer term goals. And that's where functional coherence comes in. It's making sense of our experience in accordance with our goals or a given purpose. So uh, some of you may recall early on in the webinar, we went through the eight or nine different types of relational frames at least the ones that have been studied the most. And I'm gonna lay these out here on the next eight slides. I'm gonna go through this very quickly just to get a, get a taste for how we might um, develop and make use of interventions guided by a relational framing. So <clears throat> at the center of each slide, you'll notice instead of the observing self, I'm putting the type of frame that we're using. So in this case, temporal framing. So um, uh, working with time. And I'm going to show interventions in each of the four quadrants here. So in the lower right quadrant, we might ask something like, when is the last time you can recall being connected to these values? Or we might ask, when was the last time these hooks were present for you? When do you anticipate them showing up again? In other words, um, as you are approaching this person to initiate a conversation with them, do you anticipate them these the this anxiety showing up then? So we, right? So we're we're uh, doing some uh, once again relational framing. We're relating these hooks that are happening now to the there and then, so we can anticipate them, expect them, and sort of you know reduce some of the power that they might have over our lives, and then validate that, right? So of course the anxiety would show up as you're about to initiate a conversation because. There's something you care about here. When it, what have you learned from past experiences with away moves that could be helpful going forward? So we're going into the past and into the future here. And then which toward moves would you like to be doing more of in the future? So we might start using these kinds of relational frames after we've done an overall matrix. We have everything on the dry erase board with a piece of paper, and then we might ask some of these follow-up questions. Once again to promote more psychological flexibility and, um, and from an RFT perspective, functional coherence and flexible context sensitivity. Spatial framing, where in your body do you sense these qualities you want to bring into your life? So spatial is dealing with space and that can include even in our bodies. Or where are these hooks right now? Are they up close on you? a bit further away. So when we do spatial framing, remember, we're not just talking about physical properties, but this could be symbolic properties. Like, are they right up on you here? Or are they a bit further away? Where in what situations are you most likely to do away moves? Like, where in your life are you most likely to do away moves? Where in your life are you most likely to do toward moves? Coordination framing. This is when we are relating things as similar or as, um, you know, uh, alike uh, each other. So when you're considering your values, what vulnerabilities show up for you? Like how, you know, the, we're kind of pairing these two things together. There's a, um, a quote from one of my favorite called Mindfulness for Two, 
uh, that says values and vulnerabilities are poured from the same vessel. What might any of these hooks reveal that matters to you or that's important to you here? So in other words, the sadness that you're experiencing right now, what might that reveal that matters to you here? Is there someone or something that you care about that this sadness is, is showing to us? Are there any away moves that also serve as a toward move at times? Right, because once again, if I'm uh, you know stressed at the end of the day and I don't like this stress and I go and take a bath or take a walk, a walk perhaps to get relief from the stress, well, might that bath or that walk also be serving as a toward move? And that may be a moving towards self care. How are these toward moves meaningful or fulfilling for you? How are these? So we are, once again, coordinating these toward moves with fulfillment. Distinction framing. This is like what's different or what's not happening. What is your life like when you're not in touch with what matters to you? Or if these hooks were no longer a problem, what would you be doing with your time? If they were, or, or said in another way, if you are no longer struggling with these hooks, what would you be doing with your time? Are there any away moves that don't have any costs in the long run? How would your life be different? It's a distinction. How would your life be different if you were doing more toward moves? Comparison framing. Which values are most? So comparison, better than, less than, more, less, bigger, smaller. Which values are most dear to your heart? Which ones are not as important? Which hooks tend to push you around the most? Which are you able to hold more lightly? Which, which moves bring more fulfillment and meaning into your life, away or toward? Are you generally more present during your outer or your inner experiences? And most people um, outer experiences. And notice these two uh, interventions, uh, these top two quadrants don't necessarily pertain to those specific quadrants, but rather to the axes. Conditional framing. This is if-then causal uh, relations. If you are connected with these values, how might that influence your choices? If you can make room for these hooks, what would that allow you to do that matters in your life? What effects, payoffs, costs have these away moves had on you in your life? What effects might these toward moves have on you in your life? We have two more. I'll go through these quickly. Hierarchical framing. Once again, this is about something larger, part of, a category. What areas of your life, love, work, play, health, are these values a part of? If these hooks were part of something that mattered to you, what would it be? So these thoughts and these feelings you're having right now, if they were a part of something that really mattered to you, I wonder what that would be. And sometimes questions like this might kind of stump clients at first, I mean, especially adolescents, but even adults. But I often find if we can pause with them, wait, there's some interesting and important responses that can emerge from these kinds of questions. Not always, but often. And they have a powerful effect of, of transforming the function. So where these hooks were seen as like something I got to get away from, now all of a sudden they're part of something that really matters to me. What overarching lesson may these away moves have to offer you here? And what would doing these toward moves be in the service of? And then finally, one of my favorite is deictic framing. This is perspective taking across person, space, and time. Um, and we might say, in the distant future, you're looking back on your life, what do you want to have stood for? Or how do you want to be remembered by others? If your loved one was, if your partner, your friend was experiencing this anxiety or this fear, how would you respond to them? Or how would they respond to you? When you are caught in a stuck loop, what do others see you doing? What would I see you doing? Traveling back to a time when life was meaningful, what do you notice in that time? What are you doing at that time? So these are, once again, deictic framing interventions. 
So with all that said, where I often start with clients is just their, their first life assignment is essentially to non-judgmentally notice, to observe with that observing self when you're in your head versus out in the world and when you're moving toward your values versus away from pain. And once again, toward and away is not good or bad, right? So it's just we're, we're um, looking at noticing and sorting those differences so that we can bring more flexibility and the choices that we make so that even in the presence of difficult experiences, we can do what matters. And to end with a quote by Georgia O'Keeffe, I've been absolutely terrified every moment of my life, and I've never let it keep me doing a single thing. I've never let it keep me from doing the single thing I wanted to do. Right? That's psychological flexibility. There's some uh, resources here, some continuing education resources listed here for you, both on ACT and RFT. And then there's some, um, the first two resources listed here, there's the, the essential guide to the ACT Matrix book and a few YouTube channels on the matrix. Um, there's several others, but these three in particular, I think are really worthwhile to look at. Um, and then there's other resources listed here for you as well that don't necessarily deal with the matrix, but act in general creative hopelessness and 